Good morning. Thank you for joining Smart XPD today for a presentation on the brain gut connections in Parkinson's with special guest, Dr. Mabel Lopez. We'll begin momentarily. If your microphone isn't muted, please mute yourself now, but make sure you're familiar with how to unmute for Q&A at the end. We're recording today's presentation, so if you don't want to be seen, please turn off your video. I'm Patrick Lasasso, president of Smart XPD and coordinator of our Parkinson's Life discussion. We got Trump and Francis. This is awesome. We have never had that happen. If you're going to have a technical issue, you might as well have Trump in practice. All right. Um, so this is, I'm coordinator of Parkinson's Life Discussion Group. We meet weekly, and I like to think of this as our place where we come together to learn, strengthen, and share. Today, we're so fortunate to welcome Dr. Mabel Lopez. Dr. Lopez is a licensed psychologist in the state of Florida with a specialty in neuropsychology. During her academic career and postdoctoral training, she was the recipient of various NIH grants and is published in several peer reviewed journals in the area of neuropsychology. Hang on a second, okay. I'm gonna have to see if I can mute this person. There we go. And that was not them, okay. Um, okay, all right, now hang on. I'm gonna have to figure this out. Who who's got the who's got the trumpet? <laughs> Let's try to get through the rest of this. Dr. Lopez has unique specializations of both pediatric and geriatric neuropsychology. And as a geriatric neuropsychologist, she specializes in the differential diagnoses of dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and vascular diseases. Please join me by Tooting your trumpets and welcome Dr. Mabel Lopez. All right, all right, all right. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us uh, today. And I'll you have you should have control if you want to do a PowerPoint or whatever you have, or you can just talk. Okay. Um, I, I I don't have a PowerPoint to share on the screen today. I'm on my phone and I have my PowerPoint next to me. So I apologize, but I can I can, I don't think I need the visuals. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to mute myself and let you just take over. All right. Yeah. Wasn't sure what the format was, if you were going to ask questions. So um, I, I do have a presentation that I've done before called Dead Gut Brain Connection, um, especially in Parkinson's. This is very pertinent. We often think of Parkinson's as a brain disease, but it's actually a uh, it might be well be a, a gut disease. Uh, and I'll explain that in, in a second. Um, uh, the brain, of course, has uh, many neurons, about 86 billion. And second to the brain, it's the gut that has um, the most neurons found in the body. Usually that surprises people. There's about 86, um, 86 billion in the brain and about 100 to uh, 600 million, depends on the study you read, in the gut. And when I speak about the gut, I'm talking about um, any and the lining between the esophagus to the rectum, that whole lining. Um, is filled with neurons and they do create neurotransmitters, which is also something that surprises people. In fact, the gut um, is thought to produce the majority of serotonin um, that we use. And serotonin is of course the neurotransmitter that's associated mostly with mood modulation, uh, with happiness. Uh, most uh, medicines for, many medicines for depression, I should say actually target serotonin which is actually quite important in Parkinson's since a great majority of the population might have a mood dysfunction and anxiety disorders and uh, treatment with serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors usually um, help with that. Um, <clears throat> so oftentimes uh, the brain itself is called the upper uh, or the central nervous system and the bowels is called the lower brain uh, because of its role in creating neuro uh, neurotransmitters as well. Um, uh, many diseases, uh, including dementia, might begin in the gut or might have implications in the gut, uh, which is why it's such an important topic. We also know that the gut may act independently of the brain since it can create its own neurotransmitters and it has its own um, bacteria system that can also affect neurotransmitters. And because of this, uh, it might affect uh, eating behaviors independently of the brain, uh, your weight gain, your metabolism, your muscle mass, anxiety, and even memory might be affected by uh, gut functions as well. 
as I mentioned pre previously, up to studies vary, of course, but up to 90% of the serotonin we do make is probably created in the gut. And about 50% of dopamine, which is extremely important in Parkinson's disease, is thought to be created in the gut. And this is important because we often think of um, Parkinson's as damage to the basal ganglia region called um, uh, the substantia nigra, which has dopamine in it. Uh, but we know that prior to the disease being in the brain, we often do find uh, abnormal what we call alpha synuclein, the, the protein that is associated with Parkinson's, we often find it in the gut first. And the theories vary as to how um, a gut disease eventually attacks the brain. Uh, but one of the theories that it happens through the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is cranial nerve number 10. And it's a uh, part of, uh, from the brainstem, it does kind of travel all over the body hence the name vagus, like a Latin for vagabond. It's all over the body. And it's thought that somehow uh, the dopaminergic damaging um, protein, we think, alpha synuclein, um, does travel up from the, the, the gut through the vagus nerve to the brain. But again, it's theoretical. We really don't know how it works. We do know that um, there are uh, there there is the ability to do intestinal biopsies to see if there's alpha synuclein in the intestines, um, which can uh, be positive for maybe Parkinson's disease. We know that the other diseases like Lewy bodies, for example, also are positive for alpha synuclein disease. We we also know that um, before we have sort of the cardinal movement disorder signs of Parkinson's, maybe the the tremors, the balance disorder, we often do see GI symptoms first. Um, dysphagia, the swallowing problems, are something we may see way before the movement disorder, um, which is why activities such as blowing a horn, uh, doing bubbles, uh, singing aloud is so important for Parkinson's disease because dysphagia. Uh, is pretty um, common in the disorder. Uh, uh, nausea is very common before the disease develops. A delayed gastric emptying is also something we see um, and constipation as well. In fact, uh, people usually complain of constipation 20 years before the disease even starts. And in a subset of people, they also have the opposite because the, the intestines retain so much water you might see. Um, very loose stools or, or diarrhea. Um, there's, there, there are also theories that perhaps our gut has a bigger role in emotional functioning than, than we are, um, than most of the literature has given it credit for. Um, so there's re research that um, oftentimes, and, and we, we say things in idiomatic expressions like we have a gut feeling or gut emotions, and they might actually be rooted in science um, because the, my, the gut, my, the, the bacteria of the gut could potentially be creating, um, even eating some neurotransmitters like GABA. We, we know that the bacteria loves GABA, the inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter. And we know that, um, that by treating gut bacteria with probiotics, in some cases and in, in some individuals, mood is improved as well, which is very interesting if, if you think about that. That's something as simple as having enough gut bacteria and eating pre and probiotics can affect your, uh, your, your emotional functioning. The other thing that we really have to be aware of, it's not just our own DNA that's responsible for our cognition and emotional functioning. It's also the DNA of the bacteria that lives in our guts. Um, they're not considered enough. Um, so normal brain functions uh, does depend on the amount of uh, bacteria we have in the gut. And by manipulating uh, bacteria such as antibiotics, we know it can have effects, sometimes negative, sometimes positive, in our ability to think clearly, our attention, memory, visual, spatial skills, processing speed, and even emotional functioning, which is, is, is pretty cool. We know that certain foods uh, make mood and cognition worse, and it could be uh, that those foods are affecting our gut bacteria. And of course, the big one that individuals speak about is um, all the high glycemic index foods. These are the foods that we eat and they create a big spike in, um, in our insulin, 
um, and those foods are absolutely correlated with diseases such, such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, so your white potatoes, bread, pasta, white sugar, um, and it might also be in conjunction with our blood, um, our blood sugar levels as well. We also know that foods such as, believe it or not, cow's milk, cow's milk is, is, is pretty controversial, um, but there are studies showing that the casein, which is an amino acid in the cow's milk is correlated with inflammatory processes. And there's a correlation, so we don't know if it's causal, but there's definitely a correlation between um, the consumption of cow's milk and the development of tremors. Um, so including uh, Parkinson's disease, there is, there's a higher incidence rate of tremors in individuals who do consume um, uh, cow's milk products. And now we know that a lot of the saturated fats, hydrogenated fats, the seed oils, um, do tend to disturb our gut bacteria and is absolutely correlated with um, cognitive dysfunction as well. Um, another big one uh, is soda, one regular soda, and uh, typically we're talking about dark cola, but most sodas, um, uh, regular sodas, it has a threefold correlation again with the, uh, 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 the incidence rate of having Alzheimer's disease and diet soda, has a threefold increase of having um, a greater uh, risk of, of strokes or vascular dementia. So um, no matter how you you uh, you put it, soda just doesn't seem to be the best for the for, for brain functioning. Uh, we also, of course, know it's not good for the kidneys, and when the kidneys are not working at their best, the blood is let's just call it dirty for the easiest way to explain it, and it can cause some fluctuations in cognition, some uh, lack of clarity and thinking as well. Now, some foods, as I've uh, mentioned, are not the best for the brain, uh, but there's some foods that are pretty good for the brain that we believe that they promote uh, uh, brain health. For example, foods, foods rich in antioxidants uh, because they're correlated with um, slowing uh, the aging process. And we know that dementias are a process where um, aging is, is accelerated or it is most primary dementias are a disease of aging and you're more likely to have a dementia if you are um, older. Um, we know that foods high in vitamin E's and not the supplements, but the foods high in vitamin E such as sweet potatoes, avocados, almonds are um, very good for uh, gut uh, functioning and brain functioning. And of course your omega-3 fatty foods, um, omega-3 is essential, that means our body cannot produce it. So we need it in order to have optimal brain functioning. And we do know that it, it correlates with the myelination of the brain. So each neuron has a body and that body is covered by fat cells um, and uh, which are alive. And they really need omega-3 for that fat uh, to develop properly for those cells to develop. Um, and they act as an insulation to the el electricity of the neurons because we are, are chem we're electrochemical and that's how we produce our thoughts. So omega-3 fatty acids foods would be such uh, things such as wild salmon and walnuts. And that even gets more complicated because there's different types of omega-3 foods and we absorb them differently. And fish seems to be the best choice in terms of proper absorption of uh, the, the type of omega-3s we need. Um, I do have good news. Uh, coffee has been shown uh, to reduce the risk of cognitively decline, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. This is usually where people get a little happy after all the bad news about sugar, et cetera. Um, but um, the issue with uh, coffee is of course the caffeine content. And we know there's a big correlation between insomnia and having Parkinson's disease. And as we age, the half-life of caffeine, um, how quickly we metabolize caffeine is a little longer. So after the age of 60, we do recommend that you um, do not drink anything with caffeine within 12 hours of bedtime. Even if you don't perceive uh, yourself as being extra aroused or, or hyper after the coffee, we do know it affects um, levels of your, do uh, your dopamine levels, uh, which need to be controlled right before we, we fall asleep. Um, alcohol is very controversial as well. Um, we do know that in the longevity studies, individuals who drink a little bit of alcohol tend to live a little longer 
And it might be because alcohol is neuroprotective. Um, it does thin out our blood. So it works a little bit like aspirin would work um, in terms of having less um, instead of incidence rates of blood clots, et cetera. That's a theory. But it also increases a chemical uh, neuro, neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is, is lower in individuals with memory loss, such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, however, um, there is something called alcohol dementia. It's also called a wernicke korsakoffs dementia, say mouthful. And individuals who drink alcohol in excess um, can oftentimes have a deficiency in thiamine, uh, which is vitamin B1. And the thiamine deficiency uh, will cause um, suboptimal production of neurotransmitters. Um, and so alcohol has to be drank in moderation. And the consensus is that moderation is five drinks a week, uh, one at a time, skipping a day here, or there, no more than one drink every 24 hour period with up to five um, uh, a week. So that is what moderation would mean. This, there are studies indicating that we shouldn't um, drink at all. Um, I've spoken a lot about food. Um, there's a lot of studies showing that not eating, fasting is, is quite good for the gut and the brain. Um, so fasting promotes something called autophagy, which is the body's ability to heal itself. It will either fix wonky uh, cells, cells that need to be fixed somehow, but it can also consume broken cells that are really beyond uh, their years um, or cells that would uh, you know, serve no purpose or be pathological to us, our own DNA. Um, and we do that during fasting. And, you know, we fast naturally when we sleep. So um, a natural fast would be about 12 hours without eating. Um, but in our society, you often see people who don't really give their gut a rest and they're constantly eating. And that can cause an issue. There's a lot of studies showing that 16 hours of fast, not eating for 16 hours is very beneficial as well. Of course, when we get older and we have comorbidities such as diabetes, um, we're taking medications, heart issues, sometimes fasting for long periods of time is contraindicated. So it's extremely important you ask your medical doctor uh, whether you can fast or not. And, and with Parkinson's, it's difficult uh, because as we know, the medications um, sometimes can give some people nausea. Um, some people do take uh, the carbidopa, levodopa, an empty stomach. Some people take it with something acidic so that it acts a little quicker, like with orange juice. And a lot of people avoid protein with their carbidopa, levodopa, but some people do eat a carbohydrate with it because it can make you nauseous. So again, I just want you to know about the, the data in terms of fasting, but I'm not suggesting you fast because it could be contraindicated depending on the medications that you're on. The other way that we obtain nutrition is not necessarily through the gut, although it will help the gut, um, is through the sun. Um, so here in Florida, I know you guys are in California, but here in Florida, we do tend to avoid the sun. It's, it's, it's a sunshine state. And uh, we, we either stay indoors a lot in air conditioning or we, we lather on a lot of uh, sunscreen and we're not getting the natural forms of vitamin D that we would get from being out in the sun. And the optimal parts of the body are the chest and the back. So maybe wearing a tank top um, for us to absorb uh, vitamin D properly. And vitamin D is absorbed through something called a UVB ray versus a UVA ray. Uh, so it's actually the probably one of the worst suns you can get, especially here in Florida. It's like after 10 in the morning or so. Uh, so some people do opt to take vitamin D. And we do know that individuals with vitamin D deficiency have some significant immune dysfunction. Uh, they don't fight diseases as well. And they also have some significant cognitive dysfunctions and they tend to have lower muscle mass. So vitamin D is quite important. And, and muscle mass, believe it or not, is really important for cognition. We know that the ratio of muscle to fat with more muscle and less fat is protective, is neuroprotective against uh, the most common form of dementia, which is Alzheimer's. And that's because muscles... Uh, double as a uh, sugar metabolizer. And we know that with Alzheimer's, uh, sugar metabolism is, is, is a key factor. And I know we're talking today about Parkinson's, but a third of individuals with Parkinson's will have a comorbidity with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we don't know why, but we often find individuals that have primary Parkinson's ev eventually do develop a Parkinson's plus, which is Parkinson's plus Alzheimer's disease. So anything we can do to ward off 
any other types of neurodegeneration is, is really important. Sleep. Sleep is really important for gut health and for brain health. Um, in Parkinson's, this can be a challenge. We know that um, insomnia is a hallmark feature of, of Parkinson's. And we, we also have a lot of REM sleep behavior disorder. That's when you thrash and kick at night um, and excess movement doing REM sleep and sometimes vivid dreams with Parkinson's. Uh, um, so it's really important to have that under control. Uh, and speak to your, your, your physician as to how um, you're either going to use sleep hygiene, maybe, um, for example, I gave the example of not drinking caffeine beforehand, or maybe taking melatonin or, or, melatonin or something to that effect to help with sleep. Um, it's uh, the average, the recommendation for, for sleep is between seven to nine hours of sleep with the caveat that women do tend to sleep an hour to two more than the average men. We there's a huge variability, individual uh, variability, but women by, uh, in general, if we separate the genders, women do tend to sleep a little extra. Um, and we know that if you have four more days of sleep deprivation, we will see decline in cognition. So there's, there's so much literature on sleep deprivation and how individuals do end up not thinking clearly. And we see this in night shift workers. We see this in, in, in people who have 24 hour shifts like firefighters or night shifts like nurses and physicians um, where they will um, not have the best memory or ability to pay attention because we do encode memories at night when we're asleep. Um, you can have up to three standard deviation decline in your cognition, that's, that's an impairment if uh, you don't sleep enough, that's extremely important. One of the things we do during sleep is we, um, th this part of the brain right here in the front is called the prefrontal cortex and we do rest it, uh, it does rest during REM. And we believe that that um, inactivity in the brain region is why we can have really bizarre dreams and not question it um, because that's kind of our logical center, but we also, believe that that's what helps us modulate mood during the day. So we're a little bit more irritable, if we're sleep deprived. And we also are able to pay attention and process quickly. We call it processing speed when we get a proper nice rest because the prefrontal cortex has been rested. <clears throat> In contrast, we have a lot of activation of something called the hippocampus during REM sleep. And that's deep um, in the temporal lobes. If I were able to stick my finger through my temples and tickle the, the medial part, the, the middle part of it, those are your, that's your hippocampus. And we know that it really fires during REM sleep. And we believe that that is correlated with encoding, with um, uh, memory encoding. So individuals with, me uh, with sleep deprivation oftentimes have memory issues that can be reversible. Um, sometimes years and years of sleep deprivation can be correlated with uh, both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. Um, so there's a correlation with individuals who don't sleep for many, many years properly and eventually developing a, a disease of the brain. And it, and it could be that we're just not cleaning up plaques and tangles correctly and we're more prone to mini strokes, et cetera, from the lack of sleep at night. We, we just don't know, but those are theories. Um, with lack of sleep, you can mimic actual disorders of the brain, such as attention deficit disorder, which is pretty interesting. Sometimes individuals come in with adult onset attention deficit disorder, but attention deficit disorder is really a neurodevelopmental issue that starts in childhood. And we find that they've just had terrible sleep and sometimes something like uh, sleep apnea, um, untreated sleep apnea is, is the key and, and they're sent off for a sleep study and the sleep doctor does a wonderful job of diagnosing it and prescribing the correct CPAP or um, solution to their particular um, sleep disorder. Okay. So we talked about resting. Um, the other important factor for maintaining the gut and the brain is to actually exercise. Um, exercise increases your brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is one of the few ways uh, that we can uh, increase neurogenesis, which is more brain cells. We also increase it during fasting, but I think it's more fun to exercise than not to eat if you want more brain cells. Um, and it has been shown to, um, exercise has been shown to be more effective than medications in Parkinson's disease and to slow down progression of Alzheimer's disease, which is pretty cool. 
And we know that there's a lot of studies recommending different amounts of exercise. Um, 150 minutes a week right now is, is the latest standards from health.gov. Um, just do whatever you can, um, as much as you can. Um, it doesn't have to be exceedingly rigorous if you can't do that, but anything from yoga to stretching, um, cardiovascular uh, to body weights would, would be um, amazing. Um, mental activity is also extremely important. Um, we, a new study just came out indicating that second only to nutrition, mental exercise, mental exercises and using your brain is that important uh, to uh, ward off um, uh, dementias, all the dementias. And this is because we increase our cognitive reserve. So I spoke of, of, of a lot of things that actually increase your brain cells and your neurons, but for them to connect, you have to actually use your brain and that's called uh, cognitive reserve, all that connection between brain cells. So it doesn't matter how much you have, what really matters is how well connected they are. Um, and the more challenging the event, the more connections we'll have between those, these cells, these neurons, and the more resilient they'll be. Controlling uh, mood is extremely important as well. We often see individuals with uh, poorly controlled depression and anxiety eventually do develop uh, dementias. Um, so that's extremely important. And, 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 you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be medications. Uh, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness training are just as effective in many cases as medications uh, uh, for the treatment of depression. And we've actually even shown that after CBT, cognitive behavior training or therapy, um, the brain metabolism can change as, it's, as if you were taking an antidepressant, which is pretty cool. It just takes a lot of work. Um, I always explain it as your brain is a computer and our thoughts are the programming. And if we're able to change the programming, we're able to change the chemistry which has been uh, supported with research. Okay. There are times, of course, when cognitive behavior therapy or talking yourself out of a depressive state doesn't work. And of course, I just really wanna talk if, about that if you, for more than two weeks, you have excessive weight loss or gain because of the mood, uh, lack of sleep, uh, or sleeping too much, sleeping all day, excessive fatigue, feeling worthless guilt, and of course, any thoughts of death, then you absolutely need to see a professional on medications might be the best of course um, uh, for depression. And I'm sure your, your medical doctors who are specialists in Parkinson's for depression and Parkinson's, um, the chemistry has to be a little different than run of the mill depression individuals with Parkinson's. So it's really important you see a specialist in Parkinson's. So we talked about the CPT and the mindfulness. Finally, social activity is extremely important for your brain functioning. It's, it's really uh, important that we do things like this, that we get together, we talk to each other, uh, even better if we were face to face, uh, because that's shown to be neuroprotective uh, for our brains. And so that's, that's it in a nutshell. If, if anyone has questions. Uh, this was so informative. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. Um, as you were talking, and I just, I thought I'd pop this in here and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you are feeling depressed and uh, in need of help, you can text, I think this is international, but I know we have some international folks here, but you can text 741-741. Uh, you text home to 741-741 uh, from anywhere in the United States. So that's US. Uh, and it's a crisis line and a live trained crisis counselor receive, will receive that text and uh, respond to you. So I just wanted to throw that out there for our group. Hopefully nobody's in that position, but seek help if you are. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I think I'll remove the spotlight. We'll all come back together and then I think I can. There we go. Well, we have a, a great bunch of folks here today. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um so I want to open this up. You can also, if you ha I have trouble with mute, if you want to type any questions that you might have into the chat feature, I'll be happy to, to moderate the chats. But um, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to pop off of mute if you have questions. Actually, maybe if you have questions, raise your hand. Or if you don't have your camera, just go ahead and take your hand out. OK, Vince, what you got for us, Vince? So remedy she spoke of, like, <clears throat> Could I probiotics? Eating yeah. vitamin E. 
Does that apply to people before they get Parkinson's or during Parkinson's? So do, do probiotics apply before or after Parkinson's? And I don't, I don't have the answer to that. What I was highlighting is that some studies have shown that in some individuals, supplementing with probiotics can help with mood. It's very, um, probiotics is probably a whole topic in and of itself. It's so complicated. We haven't really identified all the probiotics that we can have. There's also evidence that in, in some cases, probiotics are not, don't travel well through the whole digestive system. We have different types of probiotics and different layers of our intestine. It's very complicated. Um, and there's even, there's even evidence that we inherit our, our some, some gut bacteria and, and, and so forth from our mothers. Uh, and that there probably isn't any probiotic supplement that can potentially give you all the types of bacteria that you need. And each person might need a different set of bacteria or probiotics, mind you, depending on the, it's very complicated. So you would, uh, if you, you wanted to go down that route, you would have to see a, a gut specialist, someone who would uh, specialize in, in probiotics um, and, and gut bacteria. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things out there that they're doing. Um, probably you guys have even heard of, they're even doing like fecal transplants of, of healthy gut bacteria from one person to the other, which sounds really out there, but there's a, there's a lot going on. So we know that just taking a pill might be helpful in some people, but it might not be the probiotic you need, so. Okay, we've got a couple of chat questions here and I wanna address June and Bob. Uh, Sephron, they wanted to show this to her husband who has Parkinson's. This is going, we're recording this and this will be up on my YouTube channel. Um, so, and I'll send out um, a notification to everybody when it's up there. If you're not on my email list, uh, just shoot me an email and sign up and then we'll make sure you get in there and get a copy of this. Um, and then we have a, a related question from Cynthia and Steve. Does fasting include no coffee or tea? And then... Um, <laughs> What about decaf? Is decaf as beneficial as re regular? That's such a good question. Okay. This, okay, so there's so many studies on fasting and what fasting means. Uh, so some people say, yeah, you can fast and do uh, coffee and tea. And some people, and some studies are showing that just water fasting uh, is what we're talking about. But both have been shown to be beneficial. And even studies showing that fasting is... There's a, something called the low calorie mimicking diet that mimics fasting, low calorie fasting mimicking diet, and it's less than 500 calories a day. So prolong, et cetera, they have, they have those, those diets. So um, if you're interested in fasting, there's like a whole, I mean, I just mentioned there's a whole literature on it. Usually fasting is just water, um, but uh, some studies have shown that it's not, it's not terribly bad for you if you just have no calorie foods such as tea and, and, and caffeine. And some people do that because it staves off, you know, it, it, it helps with, it helps with um, hunger. Uh, and in terms of caffeinated versus uncaffeinated, decaffeinated, um, caffeinated probably has a little bit more antioxidants, but yes, decaffeinated coffee would also have antioxidants, just not as much. If, if you want um, antioxidant properties, you could also do herbal teas like Rubois, like the red one. Um, it, it doesn't really have caffeine, but it's really high in antioxidants as well. Great. Uh, is there a relationship? Uh, re oh, my hand. Oh, no, but no sugar or creamer was asked. I correct? know, horrible. No sugar, no creamer. Right. Uh, okay. Is there a, sorry, do we get something else on that? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, unfortunately, the fake sugars have been shown to really disrupt gut bacteria and neurotransmitters. So um, as sucralose has been shown to be uh, pretty bad for, for, for the colon, that's Splenda. Um, and, uh, and now new studies are even showing uh, uh, sugar alcohols. A study just came uh, recently as is correlated with, with different forms of cancer. Um, the only sugar substitute so far that doesn't have too much bad data on it that I've seen and who knows in the future is allulose 
Uh, but even stevia is, is becoming controversial, which I used to say, oh, it's good or monk fruit. Um, so just try to stay natural as much as possible. You're better off with just a little bit of honey um, and uh, maybe a, 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 a nut milk if possible, but so sorry about the, the sugar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there a relation between gallbladder problem or stones and Parkinson's? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I know very little about the gallbladder other than a lot of my patients don't have one and that it, 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 it uh, produces bile under the liver to clean out the fat. That's all I know about the gallbladder. I will research that for you. I know very little about the gallbladder. And what was the tea? We had somebody type in the name of you, Larry. What, which tea was the one you recommended? Rubois. No. O-O-B-O-I-S. I might be saying it incorrectly. Rubois, that's what it sounds like to me. R-O-O-B-A-S? O-I-S. Okay, I just put it in the chat. Rubas T. There you go. Thank you. Yes, that looks right. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, and, um, tea and it doesn't have uh, delicious. I think it's rooibos. Rooibos. What? It's rooibos. Rooibos. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I've been saying it wrong all these years. It's delicious. Rooibos. Okay. Yeah. It's Indian. Thank you. It's red tea. That's all I. Yes. Thank Vince you. Is our, uh, Vince is our resident bird owning uh, professor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and he, his bird is behaving because it's I don't hear it in the background. So it sounds like I spelled it wrong too. It's R O I B O I S, right? Yes. Ah, thank you. Now I hear it. Thank you for saying. Okay, it. there it is. R O I B O I S. Yes. Okay. Oh no, it's R O R O O I B. OS. Whoa. <laughs> okay, there it is. Third time's a charm. All right, <laughs> there we go. Um, so I, I'm gonna. It's we're still open for questions. And thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Lopez, for your time. I know we have a lot of interest here, and I had a couple of thoughts. Uh, I don't want to um, step on anybody that has a question for themselves. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or just pop yourself off mute. Um, yeah. So. Um, the pre and probiotics, I know you had mentioned, but uh, you, you spoke to that. Oh, you know, one of the things I was thinking you might be able to speak to is I know what they're, they're trying to get better at uh, earlier diagnosing uh, potential Parkinson's. And as I understand it, that is so they can intervene quicker or right. begin to set the table for, I, I'm not really sure. Can you talk about why early uh, diagnosis is something that we should be concerned about and could be beneficial. Right. So one of the schools of thought is that the earlier diagnosis and the earlier intervention with something like levodopa, carbidopa, which is still pretty much the best, you know, one of the best things we have, um, theoretically, some theories say it might slow down the progression of the disease, but we can also do things like exercising, which we know slows down the progression of the disease. Um, and just in general for, for better treatment, um, I'll give you an example. Some, some individuals come to me and boy, uh, they were having balance problems. So they, you know, somebody thought it was their knee. So they had knee surgery. And then of course, after, um, after a surgery, individuals with compromised minds can sometimes have episodes of three days to, to three or four months of post-operative cognitive dysfunction because it was misdiagnosed. And we know to be more careful with anesthesia in that subgroup of people. Um, so it's, it's sort of just to know and how to treat it correctly, or they were misdiagnosed with a uh, essential tremors, which believe it or not, they're so different, but people still misdiagnose them or, or they confuse Parkinson's and Lewy bodies, or they confuse Parkinson's with a uh, uh, with, with other uh, uh, movement disorders. or So it's really important for, you, for the person to get the correct treatment. My understanding is early treatment does delay the onset. And of course, um, in some individuals, uh, things such as deep brain stimulation uh, needs to be done early on uh, because once it's a, a person's a little older or has a potentially cognitive deficits, it's contraindicated. And in terms of early diagnoses, they're doing, of course, everybody knows now about the DAT scan. It's not specific, but it's pretty sensitive. Um, and they're doing skin biopsies, which is pretty sensitive to alpha synuclein. We've 
before they used to do the intestinal ones, but now we can order, not me, I'm not a medical doctor, but the medical doctor will order the skin biopsies and, and look for uh, alpha synuclein. Yeah, uh, one thing that you touched on that um, working in the Parkinson's community, um, you see very quickly is the importance of sleep. And um, I've seen it with you know my clients that I work with. If they have a couple of nights of sleep, everything looks worse. It's not their new baseline, but you can tell things got worse. If someone comes to you and they they say, you know, I'm just not, I'm having trouble sleeping. What are some of the foundational strategies you might suggest initially to to try? Yeah. So I have a whole um, handout on. We call it sleep hygiene. And I'm trying to pull it up really quick on my computer, but basically it's no matter whether, I mean, and most of, I know most people with Parkinson's tend to be retired because it, it tends to happen in older individuals, but no matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend, try to set a bedtime and, a, and an awake time. Um, it's really important. Sometimes you see individuals with erratic sleep patterns where on the weekends they stay up till three in the morning and then the weekdays they have to get up at five in the morning. Or uh, So if at all possible, try to have a steady sleep time and wake up time. Um, if possible, try have, uh, to avoid having a long nap during the day. Um, those long naps, I mean, try to limit it to 30 to 45. Those long naps would um, later at night affect your ability to have the full blocks of sleep. And, and this is really important because the way that sleep works is we're all awake now, hopefully. Um, and so we're in stage one. And then right before we fall asleep at night, we go through stage two or twilight. Um, and then we should never, ever have a stage one again. And of course, individuals who wake up, go back to stage one, then you go three and then four. Four is very short at the beginning of the night, stage four. And that's a restorative sleep, just to make a brief for your body. Then three, two, then we finally have REM. REM is very short at the beginning of the night. Then we go back. We should never go to one. We should do two, three, four is medium. Three, two, REM is medium. Um, two, three, uh, four is very short. And all of a sudden you get three, two and then REM is very long at the beginning of the night. And why is that important? Back to what I explained that during REM, we have the uh, activation of the hippocampus, the encoding of memories and the resting of the prefrontal cortex so we can pay attention and process quickly during the day. So getting those four blocks of sleep is essential to cognition. And so when we steal from it by sleeping during the day, we have that two hours of sleep during the day, we're gonna have a lot of stage four and not a lot of REM. And then we might have two or three blocks of sleep. So that, that's why we shouldn't sleep uh, nap so much. I already told, I, I, um, told you about having caffeine within 12 hours of bedtime, avoiding heavy spicy food four to six hours before um, bedtime. We have to exercise regularly in order to sleep well, but don't exercise rigorously right before bedtime because we get too aroused and we can't you know, unwind. Uh, try to use comfortable bedding. Uh, make sure the room is well ventilated. Make sure that the room is dark because screen lights will activate the, um, the brain and we will create a lot of dopamine. We'll create a lot of uh, arousal chemicals if, if we see blue lights. And that means televisions, iPads, iPhone, phones, uh, block out noise, um, eliminate as much light as possible. Do not uh, condition your brain to do anything but sleep in your bed. Um, so a lot of people uh, would do work on their bed or eat on their bed, et cetera. So that um, that conditioning is lost and you might go to bed and become want to have a snack or want to watch TV instead of sleep. Um, some people benefit from uh, relaxation techniques before bed, such as diaphragmatic breathing, or progressive muscle relaxation. Um, if a, a person has anxiety, which is very common in Parkinson's, having a journal next to the bed and writing things down so we can un, unload it is really important. Um, sleeping rituals work. Um, so having maybe some chamomile tea or, or some uh, reading a book um, can is sometimes, it's, again, we, we, we do a behavioral, um, a setup for it. If you get up in the middle of the night, um, just get up, but don't turn on the TV. You could read something boring, uh, but do not put on any uh, light in front of your eyes. Do not turn on your phone, which a lot of us do. I know we shouldn't do that. Okay. So those are the basic sleep hygiene um, ideas I have. All right. You guys got that because there's a test after this. <laughs>
<laughs> no, um, I'm so glad we're recording this. And like I said, we'll we'll send this out because that was just a chunk of awesome information. Uh, Carol has a question. I have one quick thought. I wanted you to just what's your do you have any thoughts on sound machines? Um, or, white can help some people and even music that's repetitive, like uh, Mozart um, can help some people. So yeah, sound machines, uh, whether it's like white noise or I guess they have something called brown noise now, which is pretty cool. D those type of uh, can help some people. Yes, fun. Okay, I gotta go to Carol, then we'll go to, um, real quick, uh, quick one, then we'll go to Carrie and Cynthia, I see you there too. Uh, is kombucha a, kombucha a substitute for probiotics? Yes, um, and there's so many types. So that's like a tea that's fermented, all fermented foods. Um, some studies show can be even better for you than a probiotic. Yes, um, be careful, read it, make sure it doesn't have a ton of sugar. And some of them have alcohol, so <laughs> be careful. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, oh, sorry, Carol, that's what I was, Carol, that's go okay. ahead. Okay, I just go have ahead. one quick question. You said that, the, the casein and, and milk is no good. Like for example, um, every day, every morning I have a glass of skim milk or skim milk with some cereal like Cheerios or something. Should that be avoided? And also does that apply to yogurt also? Yeah, like, and- Greek yogurt. That's a great question. I said casein. Casein, whatever, yeah. No, 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 it's really important because um, um, people ask, you know, it, lactose, Free milk, does it have it? And what you asked me, how about skim milk? Well, casein is an amino acid. So it's actually inside the protein. It's not inside the fat and it's not inside the carbohydrate because lactose is a carbohydrate, right? Most of us are lactose intolerant. Most humans are lactose intolerant. So it's not that, it's a casein. And in cow's milk, particularly the cow's milk in American cows, it's, it's an A1 casein versus an A2. Um, so it tends to cause inflammation in most people. So they do sell A2 milk. You guys have probably seen it. Um, so it has a little bit less of the inflammatory one. And we know that um, milk from goats, for example, is almost exclusively A2 and doesn't cause inflammation in humans. And most of the world actually drinks goat milk, not cow's milk. We just happen to be in the States where we like the cow's milk. It's, it tastes better to us. Um, we also um, know that individuals who like substitute with nut milk, such as almond milk, and, and the almond milk, as long as it's just almonds and water, there's some milks that are just almonds and water, maybe a little salt, um, they'll get a ton of uh, the vitamin E and so forth. The Cheerios is interesting because, boy, have they done a great job in marketing, right? But it's really a refined carbohydrate. They've done a great job of saying, hey, this lowers uh, cholesterol. And it's, and it's true, um, uh, fiber lowers cholesterol, but any fiber does. And we know that the polysaccharides from vegetables and the pectins from things like, like uh, apples actually are superior at lowering cholesterol. So um, having an apple a day, you're better off um, than a processed cereal. And I'm not picking on Cheerios. I mean, all the cereals. Um, try to think whole foods. So uh, in the morning, some apples with almond butter or peanut butter, if, if you're not allergic, would be great. Um, and if you like oats, just have real seal cut oats uh, with nuts, uh, walnuts, we need those omega-3s, flaxseed oil, um, blueberries, so you get your antioxidants. Just think whole foods would be a lot better for you than um, a cereal with, with, with cow's milk. And yogurt's not good either? Yogurt, read the I mean, like plain fat-free fire yogurt or something. Oh, I know. Fat's not the enemy. It's, uh, so um, Greek yogurt, it depends. Um, some of them have a lot of protein and the protein is high in the casein. Some of them are lower in protein. Oh. Um, it's, not, it's not the fat that's the issue here. Um, so you'll have to read the labels and how it's made. There's a lot of studies showing yogurt is excellent for longevity as well because it does have, um, uh, probiotics in it, right? So th that's a controversial one, right? It's, it's a maybe. Um, yeah. They have sheep yogurt, they do have goat yogurt, which we know is better for you, but yogurt is better for you than milk. Um, mm -hmm. If you like it, just read the label and make sure that it doesn't have any sugar. Like you said, it's it's just plain and, and right. some of them be very clean whole ingredients. Well, thank you. Okay, oh, thank you.
Uh, let's go to Cynthia. Wait yes, I, I have a quick sleep question. I know that it's important to turn the room temperature down at night and, and we do that, but is it okay just to pile the blankets on and have my body be warm? Yes. So studies show that individuals who have cold ambient temperature and sort of like get under the cover sleep way better. We, our temperatures have to, we get sleepy when our temperature drops. So sometimes even a warm bath and then, you know, hard coming out of it and then getting a little cold helps us feel sleepy. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we have any more spoken questions? Um, uh, do you recommend, I know you talked about electrolytes, um, electrolyte water? If you need it, I know sometimes there's a lot of sympathetic problems and a lot of problems with uh, orthostatic blood pressure, et cetera, and some individuals with Parkinson's, and sometimes that's recommended. Um, some individuals just become very low in their potassium levels when they have Parkinson's. It's complicated. The thing with Parkinson's is you'll see 100 people in 100 different presentations. Um, so it, it, that would be an individual question. Now, there, there are things like natural, 100% coconut water that have natural electrolytes in it. Um, the issue is with some electrolytes, you see all this artificial coloring and, and, and flavorings in it, or something as simple as just getting water with a pinch of Himalayan salt sometimes helps, but in some people that's contraindicated, it depends what their potassium levels are. And, and that's what really uh, having a really, uh, an, a Parkinson's expert who knows your chemistry will come in because we don't want to do anything you know too much of what a good thing is a bad thing um so it, i think that's an individual question and again it's out, a little bit outside the scope of what i do because i'm not a medical doctor all right um so i know there are a lot of uh diet fad diets out there um briefly what is do you have any recommendations for that or any thoughts on the you know the fad diets or i know people talk about the mediterranean diet for parkinson's yeah so the best study diet is the mediterranean diet and that's a, a real canonized it's it's been described very well um is so because a lot of people tell me well Italy is the Mediterranean. I just eat pasta every day. And that's not what I mean by the Mediter Mediterranean diet. So it's a diet really high in vegetables. It's plant-based. I'm not pro-vegetarian or veganism, uh, but uh, it, it's it's definitely very heavy in vegetables, which we need. It's a, at least six servings of, of fruits and vegetables a day. Up to two of them can be fruit. No more than two should be fruit uh, because of the sugar levels. Um, the importance of that is the polysaccharides, uh, the, the vegetable fibers are extremely good for our gut bacteria. There tends to be a lot of gut issues with Parkinson's. So a lot of these vegetables do need to be cooked like broccoli. And we know that we absorb vitamins in, in carrots, beta car carotene a lot better once it's cooked because we, we want to break down the, the cell wall. Um, so at least six servings of fruits and vegetables. Um, and uh, animal protein with fish being the best and fat fish being the very best. Um, uh, things like sardines are excellent for us. Most of us don't like sardines, but sardines are just excellent for the brain. Uh, salmon, we have to be careful with things that are high in mercury. Um, not the fish fault, it's our fault for polluting the oceans, but we have to be careful with high mercury fish. And you just have to look through, through, the, through the websites of which fish during which season have more mercury and so forth. And if you're gonna eat tuna, get the ones that are low mercury, the safe catch ones, et cetera. Um, and uh, e eating lots of nuts, uh, making sure we get omega-3 fatty acids in, uh, monounsaturated fats, which is a fancy way of saying a lot of olive oil, raw olive oil. Once we cook it with it, we know that it disintegrates and it's not as, as good. So whenever you can, add a tablespoon of raw, really good extra virgin olive oil to your food. It's excellent for your, for your gut and for your brain, for your skin. Um, things that we don't eat enough of are collagen, uh, like uh, uh, bone broth, um, oxtail, things that have uh, actual uh, minerals, bone minerals in them. Again, sardines, sardine bones, they're just excellent for, for our uh, for our calcium levels, for our, our, our bones, for our gut, uh, for our collagen, which does line our gut as well. Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm thinking of, and of course, 
water. We don't drink enough water. I see this a lot in Parkinson's. People just don't drink enough water. You have to take your body weight, divide it by, by half. So if you weigh 100 pounds, let's say 50, 50 ounces of water, and then add 32 to it, so up to 82 ounces. So someone's about 200 pounds needs almost needs a gallon of water, uh, 132 ounces. Um, so I think I covered everything, most everything with nutrition. I'm sure I missed something. Um, well, I, I have one last question and, you know, I hear this, this question comes up a lot in terms of like, um, you know, I want to be proactive. Uh, what supplements should I take? Should I take Q10? Should I take, you know, vitamin D3? Do you, if somebody comes to you with that question, what, what is your typical answer? Well, it's a little, I think, I think most supplements make really expensive urine in most people. They may not need it. In other words, we, and some people do get in trouble with too much supplementation. Um, a, a very, I mean, I have a few stories about B6. So people do something like take a B complex, which has most of your B vitamins, and then take a multivitamin, and then they end up taking excessive B6. And then they get neuropathies, they get like little tingling, they get, and they, and, and they feel sick. They end up, I had a woman end up in the ER and they, they ran everything. I mean, they're not going to run a B6 test in the ER. I mean, who would, you know, and I, I looked at her, so I'm like, my gosh, you're taking 10 times the RDA of B6 with, cause she had so many, like she had a multivitamin, she had B complex, she had another. Uh, and so, and so it can cause toxicity. Um, some vitamins can cause toxicity. I am a big, big believer in a very whole foods diet. And if you have a, a, a nutritional deficiency, then supplement that. And the most common ones that are, of course, B12, because we know that the gut lining doesn't move very well. People don't absorb uh, B12 correctly when we get older, some people. And the other one that's very common to have is vitamin D deficiencies. And then usually there's a supplementation with very large amounts of vitamin D. Uh, but, but get yourself checked out first if you're gonna do supplementation. And then there are people who've had um, uh, gut uh, surgeries, um, bariatric surgeries, for example, that they, they do have, tend to have malabsorption issues and they are supplemented. And with Parkinson's, um, if there's gut issues with emptying, um, usually the, the physician will order a, a gut stu study to see if you have something called gastroparesis, which is slowing of the emptying uh, of it. And, 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 the, and they might supplement you with liquid vitamins or even some, some injectables. Uh, but I think that uh, supplementation is very, in, it's a very individual thing. It's like medicines are very individual, tailored to what you need. I don't think there's a one size fits all for, for supplements. Okay, great. Um, Jeff and Robin, I see you're off mute. I don't know if you have a question. If you don't, that's fine. We probably have time for maybe one more. And if you have a, a question, pop yourself off mute. And if not, oh, we got a chat here. Let's see. Okay. Do you recommend anything for helping with constipation? What a great one to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what I don't recommend uh, is Senna because they, I know that over time, a lot of people have Senna the tea um, and it works by uh, simulating the movement. Um, and over time, it just makes the whole system collapse. Usually, um, fiber rich foods, a lot of walking if possible, a lot of mobility, a lot of water. Um, and some people use fibers such as psyllium. Um, some people use Metamucil. Again, I would definitely ask my medical doctor about that, um, but um, I would highly recommend too much use of Senna because eventually it just fatigues um, uh, the, the colon. It, it, just, it, just, it gets fatigued and, and uh, uh, a person becomes more constipated over time when they, with chronic use of Senna. Um, that's the only thing I can advise it. But again, I'm not a medical doctor. I just tell you what the literature says. We're, we're, I'm a PhD, so we are very recent. And we give all these recommendations would be individual, ind individually based. I put it in my report for the medical doctor to consider. And then they give, they prescribe it or not, depending on if, if they agree with me or if they have other factors that I don't know about. And they're like, oh, I can't, they can't take this because of that. So, okay. Well, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for your time today. This was simply awesome. Let's go.